All right. So today we'll be discussing this paper, fast feed fast feed forward networks from Peter Belake and Roger Watton Hofer from ETH Zurich. So what does this paper present? It is basically proposing to replace our typical feed forward MLP layers with a faster variant of it. How much faster? Well, if if this is O of W. So if we have a width W feed forward network, this would be O of logarithm of W. So almost a logarithmic speed up, which is very fast. So they say that we break the linear link between the layer size and its inference cost. Point to note that this is just the inference cost. Uh, by introducing fast feed forward, which is a lock time alternative to the feed forward networks. They are 220 times faster than them for their particular uh, setup and six times faster than mixture of expert networks, uh, which is not a much, but it is actually a much. I mean, 6x is also not something to scoff at. And they also say that it has better training properties than a mixture of experts because it has a noiseless condition execution, whereas in mixture of experts, you have a noise added to the system, which makes it uh, inherently unstable. They also say that uh, focusing on a practical use case of this, if you use these in vision transformers, then they use as less as 1% of the layer neurons. So if this has like n parameters, it would actually be using only 1% of those parameters while preserve, preserving a decent amount of its performance. So basically it is super fast. Also uh, to note that this is about inference. Their training time is almost the same as uh, your normal feed forward networks, maybe a, maybe a bit more only, but their inference uh, speed is very, very high, logarithmically, uh, exponentially high. So first they say that one of the major ways currently to speed up these neural networks is mixture of expert networks in which uh, the thing is something like if you had like a width W neural network, you'll break it down into chunks. So W1, W2, W3 and W4, which are each of length W by four, which you can see here. I mean, this could be K. Uh, k equals to 4 here right now and your output in this case would be so each of this is like an expert so this is an expert and you'll have a softmax over this so c1 c2 c3 c4 where all of these is a softmax and it sums up to one so your output would be cw1 plus cw2 plus cw3 plus cw4 this would be your output. So it is a mixture of all these experts. Now, how does this help is that say if you had a lot of these experts, so you had uh, N of these experts during inference, you can only take like this top K of them and it will. So your, your cost would be uh, W by N into K would be your cost. So you had N experts, but during inference, you're only taking K of them, the top K of them, which have most of the uh, softmax mass assigned to them. So you will ha have an almost uh, N, a constant. So your speed up in this case would be uh, N upon K. So W upon this, which would be N upon K. So if K is small, you will get a decent speed up out of a mixture of experts. Now problem with them is that first it is just a constant speed up. It's not an exponential speed up. So their method has an exponential speed up. And also they say that mixture of experts. Uh, so to in, enforce that the, uh, your model doesn't only focus on one expert. So, so that it doesn't learn like a hard constraint here. Uh, they, you have to add a noise, some noise to this system. So you have to add some noise in the softmax and that leads to some instability. And also it has only a constant speed up. 
So their method does not have this requirement of adding a noise or uh, it has an also it has an exponential speed up. Also, we'll see later that they do have some sort of noise here for like regularization. Uh, but yeah, that might be slightly different. That is to prevent overfitting. That is not to like prevent uh, collapse of experts. But yeah, going further. So yeah, here they say that this mixture of experts slows the scales down the inference time by constant, but remains linear in the width of the feed forward. So yeah, so here the inference cost would some what be w k by n so it is still linear in the width and it relies on noisy gating for load balancing which complicates training yeah so instead in their approach what they do is that they go into a lot of uh, formulas and stuff in their written text but overall on a high level what they do is that it is sort of like a decision tree, but not exactly a decision tree. So you have your input node, which is your input right now. So you have two different types of nodes, one or two different types of neurons. One is a node neuron and other is a leaf neuron. So at each node neuron, you'll have some vector, some weight and that weight will give you a single output which will have a sigmoid on top of it so it will have some probability between 0 to 1 and so this is a node this is a node which will have some output which has a sigmoid on top of it which uh, which gives you a score from 0 to 1 and based on this you will pass it to the next node which will again have like more of them and it will go on go on go on until in the end you will reach a leaf you will have some leaf which will have some width say L and it will give you an uh, L dimensional output or some dimensional output so you have two sets uh, two types of parameters one is the node parameters which are also like neural networks in themselves with a single output which uh, helps in like deciding whether to go down the left path or the right path and once you reach the leaf you have a different set of parameters which are like the actual weights which you will use so these are the actual weights which you will be using so it is sort of like a decision tree but a differential decision tree uh, and obviously this so if you have a depth you will have 2 to the power d leaves these many leaves each with width l right and at inference time you only have to do this uh, traversal of the binary tree which will be o of d and d is d can be like your 2 to the power d times l can approximately be equal to w so in some sense your uh, complexity is o of d plus l ish because you will first traverse down this o of d and have some weight multiplication here so it is something like that which is almost logarithmic in w they have a better complexity analysis, but you can imagine that this will, uh, this is like a decision tree which will, this is like a binary tree which will like split the space, and you so it will have a log exponential division of the space in some of some sorts, but to like traverse down it, you only have like you only have to traverse one path. You don't have to go through all paths, so you'll have a time complexity of d but it will divide your space log, uh, exponentially so you'll have a, a exponential speed up also this is during inference during training they have a soft uh, gating so while during inference you will all so if this is 0 to 1 you will round it off and if it is closer to 0 you'll go to left if it is closer to 1 you'll go to right this is during inference during training you will have the same mixture of experts sort of thing so your, your output would be c1 
L1 plus C to L2. So you will actually go through both of them and uh, add their outputs based on the soft max. So during training, you'll take a soft getting, whereas during inference, you will have a hard getting so that you only have to traverse through one particular path and gain that exponential speed up. During training, you will not have that. You'll traverse the entire tree and like you will go this way also, this way also, this way also, this way also, this way also. And so its complexity would actually be o, around O of W only plus actually some constants, so some other terms. So it would actually be more than a feed forward neural network. But during inference, it will be very fast. So that is something. Also, okay, we'll come, at, come to something later. Uh, you can see that there is a difference between your training in training forward pass and testing forward pass. In testing, you are just going one, through one path, and in your training, you are going towards many paths. So that should lead to some degradation in performance. But they have a way to handle that. It's called hardening, and we'll come to that later. So yeah, that is an overall overview of how this works. So you can see it here also. So you have the root node. You have some node weights and that weight has the soft max and based on that you go left or right you have a left child right child and yeah it just goes on and in the end you have these leaf nodes which have a particular uh width inference inference width yeah so a small subset of node neurons are set apart to choose what mixtures of leaf neurons are to be computed as the training progresses, the region boundary hardens and the mixture tends towards selecting only one lock time accessible leaf. What they mean is that after, during training, uh, so this is what hardening is. Their training happens in such a way that over the process of training, these constants, these uh, softmax getting C1, C2, themselves tend to become like almost uh, binary. So this will become something like 0 0.9, 0 0.1 or something. So it might start off as like 0 0.4, 0 0.6, but during the process of training, it will become like 0 0.99, 0 0.001. So their training happens in such a way that uh, over time, their softmax becomes more like a hard max, and it sort of hardens. And in the end, you just have one of the lock time accessible leaf. Yeah. Here they go into some notations, which is like the complexity and all the stuff. So yeah, here they say that for a choice of L, you can choose D equal to log to L, which is actually two to the power D L equal to W, which is what I used previously. And you can access the leaf in O of T, which is O of log of W again here. Yeah. And this is this training inference where you have a soft mixture, right? Whereas during inference, you have a hard decision. You only take one of the choices, whereas during training, you take both of them, right? However, they do mention that this process of hardening, so this thing where uh, the gating tends to go towards binary decisions, this occurs more in settings where the representation, this basically occurs more for simpler problems. So where the representational capacity of the model is enough, they observe that this type of thing happens. For more complex problems where the representational capacity might not be a lot, they have to add a regularizer to enforce this. And they'll talk about this later, but yeah, they say that here. In settings where the representation power is plentiful, the process takes place on its own of hardening. In settings where more representational power may be warranted, like for vision transformers, uh, this does not happen such well, and for that they need an extra loss. Also, they say that uh, because of hardening, your their space is divided into multiple regions. So, in some sense, each of these leaf nodes is like a space in the uh, latent space with a decision boundary. So. Yeah, it would be something like this, right? Uh, because at each space, at each node, you divide the latent space into two parts. So after the end, you'll have an exponential number of subspaces, sublatent spaces, and they say that this uh, allows 
some interpretability to the model in some sense because you have these uh, different regions which belong to a particular expert and this this can be used to partition the input space for interpretability model, model editing and other stuff okay yeah and then they go into some more details they have a lot of text uh, it is more or less says the same thing which i said right yeah in the cases where they the hardening does not occur by themselves they have a loss for it which is this particular term and what it basically does is it minimizes the entropy of the node gatings so at a particular node you have like a weight and a single output and a softmax on top of it which will basically give you a pro probability so it will give you a number from 0 to 1 and a distribution from 0 to 1 can be interpreted as a Bernoulli variable of p and 1 minus p so if your output is like 0.6 you can say that it has it is a Bernoulli distribution of 0 0.6 and 0 0.4 you can equate it to a coin having 60% probability of a head and 40% probability of a tail basically this would be the case and what they say is that they had a loss which is the entropy of this distribution so and we have to minimize the entropy so a probability distribution so if this is the uh, pdf the probability the function of probability distribution function the maximum entropy which has the distribution with the maximum entropy is the uniform function because that is the most random thing you can think of entropy means you have to make it more random so uniform so if each outcome is equally likely that is the most random and the least entropy is uh, uh, this is called a Dirichlet function or something basically all your probability there's only a single outcome which is uh, likely this is the most deterministic say if your probability is 0 comma 1 so 1 is the probability of getting heads and zero is the probability of getting tails so you only get heads so it is totally deterministic or your entropy is the least so they and this is what we want in a getting hard this is what hardening means so that is why we are uh, lowering the entropy so we are adding a loss for the entropy okay now they mention some of the problems that might occur one of them is over fragmentation so uh, or oh, sorry localized overfitting that will happen and will basically happen as you would expect even in a decision tree so if your model has a very high depth so and it has a lot of like lots of lots of uh, basically a lot of nodes so in the end your space would be very small and like it would be very fragmented in some sense so even in decision trees if you have a lot have very high depth so your in the end your network would won't be learning much it would actually like carry create a path for like all the patterns so for all the training data it will observe it will create a different pattern and just map it to them instead of learning anything useful so this is the same as the overfitting which occurs similar to the overfitting which occurs in like decision trees the other is the shrinking batch problem which is the case that if there are a lot of leaf nodes then each particular leaf node will have very few training examples for it because very few training examples would be routed to it and in that case it won't have like enough data for it to fix this to fix the first case the localized overfitting they provide they suggest a sort of regularization in which uh, at each node the soft decisions can be randomly transposed with some low probability so this distribution p and 1 minus p might be transposed to 1 minus p comma p at each node so, in, so instead of like 0 0.3 0 0.7 it might get converted to 0 0.7, 0 0.3 at each node with some random probability. This will add some randomness 
and some noise and in this sense it sort of acts like similar to dropout not exactly similar to dropout but it's something similar to it so they do this to avoid this overfitting now at this point i feel like this is like this they said that their approach is better than mixture of experts because it does not have any randomness in it this feels like randomness to me so i'm not sure exactly what is the case but yeah and for like for the uh, shrinking batch problem you probably have to tune your hyperparameters in such a way that you have a decent uh, sample size uh, training examples for each of your nodes yeah. now the other thing which they sort of talk or in some way rant about is that their approach does not have a very easy uh, parallel implementation so a very easy CUDA implementation because it is conditional in some sense so at inference you have to make a decision like at e each node you have to make a decision of whether to go left or right and then left or right so it has to happen in some sense iteratively and this is not very well implemented in CUDA so they say that they're not able to like get the entire like get the maximum speed up which they actually could and they say that uh, matrix multiplication is very over optimized right now so a feed forward neural network which is just a matrix multiplication is very over optimized like it has a lot of uh, custom support from the hardware itself and so that makes it very fast and their approach does not have this hardware support or uh, efficient CUDA kernels so they can't like get the total speed up from it but even then even with that their approach like even with a not so optimized CUDA implementation their approach is still very fast also then they go into some details over their uh, accuracy and stuff you can go into it I did not find it very interesting overall obviously as you increase the number of parameters it gets better and if you increase them a lot or in a bad way then it leads to overfitting and all those stuff happens and their approach is obviously much much faster as we said as we saw previously so yeah that is overall it one interesting thing which they observe is that for larger models so uh, they use their feed, fast feed forward network in a vision transformer so a huge model they replace the feed forward networks with the fast feed forward networks and in that case they observe that uh, first of all single neuron so feed forward layers with inference width one are also decent performing so in the end at inference you are only having one node this is very very less is also good enough for a very deep vision transformer type of network and also the effects of over fragmentation so that overfitting problem uh, is also suppressed in case of like multi-layered or very deep transformers they also have this follow-up work uh, exponentially faster large exponentially faster language modeling in which they replace a BERT model with their feed, feed forward net fast feed forward networks and call it ultra fast BERT and it says that it only uses 0.3% of its neuron during inference time and it is like super fast so it is like 78 times faster than the approach so yeah their approach does work seems like and did in this paper also they rant a lot about like not having proper optimized kernels for it and like a feed forward network having a lot of good kernels and here is like the uh, here is like the code base so they have a code which you can refer to if required they have made it a pip package which you can use I think yeah you can just use it instead of I think a uh, linear layer only so yeah they have converted it to a pip package which you can use so yeah that was mostly it for the paper it seems very interesting maybe we'll see more uh, research on this and people will maybe write good CUDA kernels for it and we'll have more uh, faster implementations but yeah that is up to time to decide yeah that's all that's all for the video thanks for watching